I said, I'm going to start the year 2020, never missing going to church. And I remember I was on vacation. What a year to start. I know. <laughs> then God church was at home. Made that happen for yes. you, right? Access more. Life is like a roller coaster, but it's better when we go through it together. Welcome to the Candace Cameron Bure podcast. Our theme this season is reset body, mind, and soul. And my guest today is Julie Chen Moonves. With four daytime Emmy awards from her years at The Talk and longtime host of Big Brother, Julie Chen Moonves is an accomplished news anchor and CBS producer of 26 years. In 2023, Julie published an intimate and inspirational memoir, but first, God sharing her transformative spiritual awakening and highlighting the importance of standing in truth. Julie, welcome. Candace, thank you so much for having me. I I have to tell you how how excited I am that you're here, how humbled I am that you're here. And I'm going to I'm a crier. I don't want to cry right away, but I listened to your book and in your first chapter, you brought me to tears. Wow. Because first, a- anyone that comes to know Jesus, it is just, it's a, it's a miracle. It's hallelujah. It's praise the Lord. And as someone in the entertainment industry, to see another person in the entertainment industry who's had a long-standing successful career pivot at age 48. Yes. Yeah, six years ago, I to, made that pivot. To knowing Jesus oh, was like, that I is just cry cried. worthy. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, you feel like you have so much working against you because in the entertainment business in Hollywood, you know, saying the word Jesus will clear a room. Yep. And it um, frightens a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of um, closet believers in Hollywood yeah. because they're afraid if they come out in front and declare it publicly that it might um, hurt their career. Mm-hmm. And that is a shame. And I hope to see that change. And I hope, you know, with me coming forward and like, I am still the same Julie in many ways. Yeah. And any change that I have made are for the so much, but like, if you like Julie before, you're going to love the Julie loves Jesus, <laughs> right, you know? Right. So, um, you know, and I don't think people know how to put into words what it is they fear unless it's, they fear the unknown, you know, mm-hmm. people seem to judge when it's something they're not familiar with and they're not a part of. And I hope it's as simple as that. Cause I'm like, who doesn't love Jesus? Mm-hmm. What's not to love? Right. You know, right. He loves us all. And yeah. he, we are welcome at the table. Come one, come all, come as you are. What is wrong with that? I know. But it's people who don't even believe in, and think it's a fairy tale. I mean, the yeah. skeptics out there, that's where it gets difficult. I think for people that aren't confident in sitting in their faith and being outspoken, it becomes fear driven by man. Yeah. It's if you don't have faith, then I could see why you don't believe because having faith is believing in something you cannot see. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, when you say you want the evidence, well, there's so much in scripture. I mean, that is the word of God. I mean, the miracles that he performed, what does it hurt to believe? Right. You know? Yeah. Well, I can't wait to dive into this with you. And, you know, you have had this incredible journey that we could spend hours and hours talking about within your career, but I really want to focus on your faith journey. And I know that's what my listeners and and viewers would love to hear about most. And is there a moment in your life when looking back now today that you can say, oh, I, I see God working even when I was a kid? Oh, there was, there are many instances now that I know Jesus, mm-hmm. I look back and I think of, he was right there, but I didn't open my eyes. I'm not so sure when I was a kid, if I can mm-hmm. think of anything specific, but a few that come to mind. Well, yes. Okay. 
You know, when I was growing up, I'm a child of um, immigrant parents, mm -hmm. Chinese immigrant parents. I have two older sisters. And I had dealt with some rejection in my life. Like my two older sisters, very smart. They went to this very impressive high school called the Bronx High School of Science. Mm -hmm. You have to take like, it's like, a, it's like an SAT type test to get in. I did not get in and I took the test twice. Mm. And it, now I look back and it was like, Jesus was saying, no, you're actually gonna go to St. Francis Prep. I would have never gone to this Catholic high school if I had gotten accepted like my two older sisters and followed in their footsteps. And even then I went to, I went to this Catholic high school the last three years of high school, but I still wasn't taking his call. I mean, mm -hmm. he was there right there, but I made lifelong friendships. My best friend to this day is someone I met there at age 15 who loves Jesus. So it was like, he was coming at me from all angles, but I, I wasn't, <laughs> listening. And were your parents Catholic or was the Catholic school, it had a program that you wanted to go to? My mom didn't want me to go to the public school I was zoned for mm -hmm. because she didn't think it was safe. And this was in Queens and she was probably right. I think she thought I was either going to get like beat up or pregnant or both <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> okay. or all the above. And, um, and a lot of the kids from my junior high who didn't go to Bronx Science either went to St. Francis Prep, or which was co-ed, or St. Agnes, which was all girls, or okay. Holy Cross, which was all boys. So it was a natural feeder school. And um, my mother decided at age 17 she wanted to practice Catholicism, even though her mother was Buddhist. And part of it was my mom grew up in Burma to a very wealthy um, businessman who had many wives mm. and many homes. And my mother, um, that caused her a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And seeing that cause her mom a lot of pain, that was um, a problem. And she found Catholicism was, you know, something that morals, that she could align with. Mm -hmm. And because of that, she never wanted to tell me and my sisters what faith to practice because she made her own decision at 17. So she didn't, I wasn't baptized until I made the decision yeah. uh, in 2022 mm -hmm. to get baptized after I had started my walk with Jesus. Yeah. It was, you know, it was, I was, <laughs> 2018, I was kind of like a newborn learning how to crawl and walk and learn the language yeah. and learn to speak. And then by 2022, you know, I was ready. Um, I want to hear my, that story too. <laughs> yes. that. And then, and my father, he, um, I would see him. Oh, I didn't wear it today. I wore a different cross. I would see him when I was younger wearing this gold cross, but we never went to church and we never talked about religion. And I think my dad only wore that cross because the whole reason he came to America was because he and one of his brothers, they were sponsored by um, a church that brought them mm -hmm. here. So he had a lot of gratitude, but um, no, I, I didn't grow up with um, religion in, in my house, okay. but I believed in God, you know, and I, yep. and I prayed and a lot of it was, I'm sure because I watched Little House on the Prairie and saw them pray and mm -hmm. go to church. So like my sister and I who shared a room, we, we would do that. But it was almost by rote. And, you, you know, the prayers sounded, you know, just very simple, like praying for my family. And I used to always say the same thing. Please said me and my family be healthy, wealthy and wise, healthy, wealthy and wise. And then when I got older, whenever I prayed and up until like I would say age 48 before I found Jesus, my prayers sounded like a Santa letter. It was like, take, take, take one way. And here's what I want, God. I want this. I want that. Da, da, da. And it yeah. was all about me. Yeah. Um, but little did I know, um, uh, I was so, um, childlike and, and just ignorant and foolish, mm -hmm. but God is patient and he yeah. is wise. And, and I learned. So before we go into that 
part of your of your journey within faith. Tell me about wanting to be a journalist because I have to talk about your career for a little bit. I mean, yes. I want to. Yes. Did you always know you wanted to be one? No, I was, it was probably like 1980 or 1981. So I was 10 or 11 years old and growing up in New York City, the only time you saw Asian faces, faces on TV was when there was a poorly dubbed Kung Fu movie. Mm. And my father used to, and it would get him every time. And he would shout at the top of his lungs in Mandarin, which means hurry, hurry up and come, hurry up and come. There's an Asian face on the television. Oh, wow. And we'd all run downstairs. And then one evening, my mother and I were watching the local news and we saw an Asian female main anchor at the desk. And her name is Kaidi Tong. And I think she's still on the air in New York. Back then she was at WABC Channel 7. Mm -hmm. I think she's at one of the independent stations now. And my mother was mesmerized. And she said, that is what you should do for a living when you get older. So she planted the seed. And she watered it subtly. Mm -hmm. And I, my mom was my best friend growing up because my two older sisters were thick as thieves. And okay. I was just the nuisance. So I hung out with my mom. I helped her in the kitchen. I do my homework in the kitchen. I hung out with her. Yeah. And so she had, and still does to this day, ha has a great amount of influence over me. And I do feel that she has a lot of wisdom. So when I graduated junior high school, you had to predict where you would be 10 years from now. And I, I set it in stone. I put it into print. I said, anchoring the news in New York. So then when it became time to apply for colleges, and I think this was the hand of God. I'm a girl in Queens. Why am I getting a letter in the mail from USC's journalism school? Did you not apply there? I, did, I ended up applying because they must have had at like college fair night. Oh. They must have had someone at a desk there. And I must have filled out a postcard. Not that I can remember doing it, but I'm not saying it didn't happen. Uh-huh. But why else? But specifically from the journalism school. Wow. So because I got that letter, I thought I'm going to apply. I knew I wanted three things out of college. I wanted a big city. I wanted a jur journalism program. And I wanted to be far away from home to really just be free and have yeah. my independence. And that checked off all the boxes. So I applied, I got in, and I accepted without even walking on the campus. And this is another hand of God, because it wasn't my first choice. I wanted to go to either Penn mm -hmm. or Boston College. Penn, flat out rejected. Boston College, waitlisted, and then rejected. And the other school I got into, which was not hard at the time, was NYU, but my mother didn't want me to go there and I didn't want to go there. That's in my backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom said to me, my sisters, you have to go away and really, you know, learn how to do everything on your own. But the other looking back, and I know this is God was right there. I was always the last person picked on teams. I do not have any hand eye coordination. <laughs> and when I was in my early 20s, I went on a whitewater rafting experience. And I remember listening to the guide say in the morning, um, okay, here's what you do on the small chance you get thrown from the raft. We're going to throw you this rope. And when you catch the rope and we pull you back in, make sure to turn your back to us so that your head creates like a, a shell. So you're uh -huh. not, you know, ingesting water. Yeah. I got thrown from the raft. I don't know how. I do know how. Jesus, it was like a, that rope was like a magnet to my hand. I caught it. I mean, think about it. You're like right. struggling to, to get above water. I caught the rope and I, and I remember how to turn around. And we got back at the end of the trip. We got back to um, land and I heard my raft guy telling her boss like how scared she was. She was like, I've never had that happen. Like, and they were relatively new. And she was panicked. Oh like I goodness. thought I was going to lose someone. 
And, you know, what I've also learned since I've gotten to know God is there is no such thing as luck or, or coincidence. Yeah. That wasn't luck. Yeah. That was a blessing. And Absolutely. that was a gift from God. Yeah. So um, these little things I look along the way and I'm like, oh, it, yeah, it's so interesting when you when you are a believer and have lived so much of your life not as a believer, but to look back and see all the traces and places that God was right there alongside yeah. is it's really incredible yeah. and and very humbling too. Yeah. I mean, landing me at USC for that journalism program because had I gotten into Penn, I was like this you know, 50, 50 about journalism, but I also was very good at math. You know, I was on the math team, mm -hmm. nerding out all that kind of stuff. I thought, oh, I can go to business school if I get into Wharton. And um, God was like, no, rejection, you're going to go here. And, um, and then getting into the business, my first internship was really eye-opening into, you know, what the business is all about. Cause it looks so glamorous when you're, you when you're at sure. home watching like <laughs> Diane Sawyer, you know, go off to Egypt and do these interviews or whatever it is. Yep. And, um, I was an intern at what was then called CBS this morning, which was their morning news, their two hour morning news program. Mm -hmm. I think now it's just called CBS mornings. 10 years later, I am co-hosting the show with the guy who was the host in 1989 when I was an intern. His name is Harry Smith. Wow. That's also. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Lord. Totally. You know, um, so it was like internship after internship. And then you have to typically, if you want to be in front of the camera, you have to start in a small town covering news. Mm -hmm. And my small town and my break was my big break was Dayton, Ohio, but also everything is happening on God's time. I graduated like everyone else in 1991 and all my friends from journalism school got their first job within months, you know, in small markets like Medford, Oregon, Lubbock, Texas, mm -hmm. Erie, Pennsylvania. I had four years of rejection letter after rejection mm -hmm. letter. I didn't get my first on-air job until I was 25. You know, I feel like my whole career in life was dealing with rejection that was meant to be that ended up landing me where on the path that God had yeah. already planned. All that rejection is also character building. Totally. And it allows you to figure out what you want to do. It allows you to become stronger. It allows you to set your mind on things. I mean, or you can choose not to do those, but rejection is often one of the best things that can come, become, come in your life. It's how you grow. Yeah. And then when you do get it or whatever you do get, <laughs> you're really appreciative. So sometimes a, a no and a closed door, someone said to me recently, God has three answers. Yes. Wait. And instead of no, it's, I got something better. Yeah, I like that. So it was, it was no, but it was really, I got something better. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You have hosted Big Brother for, since its inception, since 2000. Yes. And that, that whole show is really about how people act when they are under pressure, or at least that's one of the big takeaways for me. And you've interviewed these people, I mean, countless interviews. and. I want to know, what have you learned from the people on the show? I have learned that we all have many facets. We are not all good. We're not all bad. Um, put in a pressure cooker situation, you never know what choices you're going to make. I've learned that people don't have a lot of self-reflection. But when you go into the Big Brother house and you're being watched and judged, right or wrong, by the viewers... And you come out and you see how you live. Mm -hmm. You get to be a fly on the wall in your own life. And you get to see what people are saying about you. It's like holding a mirror up to your face, like mm. two inches away. And then you get the people who go through Big Brother are fortunate enough to have that self-reflection. Then they have to ask themselves, who do I want to be? Am I that, am I that person? Do I like that person? And where do I need to change? So 
you know, I've, I've learned that human nature, it's, um, we're not all people of character, but it's never too late to pivot, right? Mm, Isn't that what yeah. Christianity is about? Yep. Repenting? I mean, think about when you're a child, you know, it's me, selfish. Why yeah. I'm crying, when I'm tired, when I want this, me, 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 it's all about me. And then when you grow in your faith, it's like, oh, it's not about me. It's about serving and loving others. So tell me about the moment. Tell me about the pivot in your life when you discovered your faith. It really was. It's often in times of darkness that the light shines the mm -hmm. brightest. It's easiest to see the light then. And that was my situation. It was in the fall of 2018. And up until that point, um, I had a very big and busy life and my false idol was work. And my husband was running CBS for 24 mm -hmm. years. I'm juggling two shows, um, Big Brother in the Talk, loving my career. We have a young son together. And suddenly, our whole life as we knew it, work-wise, got turned upside down. Mm -hmm. He left. And as a result, I was forced to leave my job mm -hmm. at the talk. Um, I didn't realize, I was a little bit naive. I didn't realize that um, two people that I had been working with for years um, took that opportunity. You know, the king was dead. Now we can get her. Now we can tell... CBS, we don't want her to come back. Mm. And I remember thinking it was first, I need you. I got a call from the head of CBS daytime. And she said to me, I need to ask you to stay home tomorrow. And it was the night before premiering the ninth season of the show. And she said, you know, two of your coworkers have said that they have to discuss what has happened to your husband having to leave CBS mm -hmm. and they are not comfortable talking about it with you at the table. So I need you to stay home tomorrow. Cause I know if you come to work, they won't show up. So I said, okay. So I stayed home and I watched, and I turned on the TV and it was watching my own funeral. I saw two women who I thought were my friends completely bury me. And what they said made it impossible for me to ever sit at that table again. Mm. So that evening, the head of CBS Daytime and I got on the phone and we cried and we started to plan my announcement of exiting. And like we had been there for each other through like near divorces, births of, you know, children, grandkids, like so much going on, you know, like outings together. Like I really felt like these are my sister wives. That's their family. Yeah. So, um, but such is life. Yeah. But so that happens and I am angry. I'm confused. I feel lost. I feel like I've been stripped of my identity and I was bitter. So one more, and I had thought about, you know, um, I had thought about going to church, but I never went because mm. I was looking for answers, but it was one morning I woke up and I got an email from my favorite aunt who is born again, Christian. And she helped raise me when I was a baby. And she and her husband, my uncle, they're both born again, Christians. He is a cancer survivor, became a born again, Christian. And he survived um, the North tower. He was in the North tower when it got hit on nine 11. Oh, wow. And so she email emails me and says, my friend Angela from our church in New Jersey called me and she is a prayer warrior and Holy Spirit spoke to her and said that I, your aunt, I need to tell you about Jesus. And she said, you know, we have a very big family. I've never been pushy about my faith. Mm -hmm. You know that she goes, but I'm just letting you know that your uncle John and I are praying for you and your whole family. And I pray that you get to know Jesus. And when you do, you will have peace that transcends all understanding. And that email brought me to tears. Mm. And I said, I'm going to church today. And it was a Thursday morning and I dropped my son off at school. 
I don't know if there are three churches right by my house that I passed by, I had passed by millions of times. And I don't know if the church that I chose that morning, if they normally have their doors unlocked at 825 in the morning mm -hmm. on a weekday, but they were unlocked that day. And I walked in and I had the whole place to myself. There were just a few candles burning. And that's when I broke down on my knees ugly crying, crying to God to help me and to lift me up. And mm -hmm. he took me by the hand in that moment. And I walked through the door. It really started then. In 2024, delicious, safe, and convenient meal prep is just one box away. This is your year to ditch the mystery of the meat aisle and get American meat delivered to your front door instead. Subscribe to any box and they'll add over two pounds of pre-trimmed, better than organic chicken breast to your order for free. Not once, not twice, but every order for a year. Good Ranchers Chicken will change what you know about chicken. It's pasture raised, given zero antibiotics or vaccines, and is so tender and juicy, you won't believe it's the same meat you've been cooking most of your life. And when my Good Ranchers box showed up, everything was perfectly frozen. Simply go to GoodRanchers.com, pick your box, use my code CANDY, and enjoy $189 of free chicken in 2024, plus $20 off your first order. Stock your fridge with easy to prepare, clean, delicious meat all year long. If you're not sure which box to choose, try their brand new weekly essentials box full of pre-trimmed beef and chicken that helps you meal prep so you can save time without sacrificing flavor. Make sure you subscribe today and use my code CANDY to claim over $200 in free chicken and new year savings. GoodRanchers.com, American meat delivered. How did it feel for you? Did it feel like an instant connection or was it something that has learned and you've learned and grown over the years reading the Bible? Learned and grown over the years reading the Bible. I think in that moment, it did feel different mm -hmm. because in that moment, I felt hope, mm. but I didn't know where it was going to lead to. And then after I got my sea legs, I started to go to church on Sundays, if my schedule worked out, if, you know, I mm -hmm. felt like it or I woke up in time, it wasn't, you know, a, a religious thing. And I would tick off the box. And that happened for the first year. But then a year later, I said, I'm going to start um, a year plus later. I said, I'm going to start the year 2020, never missing going to church. And I remember I was on vacation. What a year to start. <laughs> I know. Then God church was at home. made that happen for yes. you, right? He's like, See? I'm surely going to make sure that you don't miss a day. <laughs> yes. And you can go to any church you want. You yeah. have a computer. You have a <laughs> exactly. signal. So, uh, and I remember being in Singapore, visiting um, my family over there and finding, you know, a Presbyterian church, uh, that was ser served, you know, geographically was desirable and going there and I never missed. And then because of lockdown, one of my favorite cameramen in Dayton, Ohio, for my first on-air job, who had since become a pastor, went to seminary, became, and now pastors a church in Boston. He reached out and said, you've never seen me preach. You've only known me as a cameraman. How would you like to zoom on to my church this morning? Because I had tech. He here's the thing. When I was down and out and like the phone wasn't exactly ringing, mm -hmm. you know, that's when you find out who your true friends are. Oh, I know that well. Yes. <laughs> and this pastor, my former cameraman who I hadn't talked to in probably about it would have been 1997. The last time I spoke to him. Yeah. And then 2018, you know, 21 years later. That's when he contacted me. He said, Danita and I, his wife, who was our six o'clock producer in Dayton, he said, Danita and I are praying for you and Les and Charlie. He had never even met my husband or my mm -hmm. son. And I thought, wow, here's someone. I can't do anything for him anymore. My phone isn't ringing. 
he has resurfaced in my life. They became my spiritual advisors. They sent me my first Bible, mm -hmm. um, a study Bible. I didn't even know what a study Bible is. And he said, we will be your spiritual advisors. So I would text them questions all the time. And one Sunday morning early in LA, I texted a question and he said, since you're up early, if you feel like it, do this Zoom link, Join, uh -huh. you know, come to my service. And I said, okay, everybody might have my screen off. I'm still in my pajamas. And it was August of 2020. And I've never gotten ready so fast in my life again. <laughs> Hand of God, right? <laughs> Jesus. Like I pulled it together and it was 20 minutes before the sermon. I pulled it together. I turned on my screen. And now I'm, uh, that's one of five churches I'm a member at now. Wow. So I could zoom on from LA to their morning service and then make it to my um, local church near my home by 930. So you're, you're now studying the Bible. You're in the word of God. How did that dynamic change at home for you? I, I know for me, it was like when I got on the Jesus train, you know, everyone looks around and you're like, is this going to last for a couple of weeks, a couple of months? Is it going to die down? Is this real? Is this staying? And, you know, it's it can be shocking for the people that you've lived with that are your close friends, relatives that aren't believers. You've all been thinking the same for the most part. And then when all, all of a sudden you change, how did how is the reaction from the close people in your life that weren't believers? My husband is Jewish mm -hmm. and he's culturally Jewish. He's mm -hmm. not religious. And he has been supportive of everything that I've ever, you know, wanted to be a part of, felt passionate about. So he was like, okay, but I could see sometimes when he would see me wearing a cross, he would kind of like shudder, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why does this make you so uncomfortable? And he, he couldn't explain it. And I said, why don't you believe Jesus is God? And he said, because I wasn't taught that. I yeah. said, okay, that's fair. Mm -hmm. I said, but do you think it's possible? He goes, it's possible. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. There's that opening. <laughs> now let's yes. kick over that door. Yes. And it became better you know, my son was only in the second grade. Mm -hmm. So he didn't think anything of it until the Sunday I said, you got to come to church with me. And he was like, suddenly I'm Jewish. He goes, <laughs> I'm like dad, I'm Jewish. And I said, Charlie, <laughs> please. And he goes, why doesn't dad have to go? So then I said to my husband, I said, listen, you got to do me a solid. You got to go. So that morning he goes, come on, Charlie, put on shoes. We're all going to church. And again, this is God yep. delivering and showing up. Yep. We walk into church. We sit down. The first hymn, my husband is singing at the top of his lungs, <laughs> not even looking in the book. And I go, how, how did you, you know? know? <laughs> and he goes, how do you not know this song? He goes, this is a Thanksgiving song we used to sing growing up in school. I said, it is. And you went to public school in Long Island, right? So I'm like. We didn't sing in my school when I went to public school in Queens. So, um, and the sermon that day was about the, the pastor was saying that his friend was going through a hard time because he was accused of doing something he didn't do. Mm, mm. And it's just, I was like, that was like a custom written sermon mm -hmm. from God as a gift. And my husband left church that morning. He was like, he goes, I liked it. He goes, because I can understand, you know, the, the sermon. It was easy to follow. And they make it about present day issues. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. I go, it's not like when you had to go to Sunday school for your bar mitzvah. You right. Know? And um, then they started both coming with me. And then my husband, after about, I don't know, six or seven weeks, he's like, there must've been like a big football game on or something. <laughs> He's like, you're pushing it now. He's like, I'll go next week. And, um, and now my son and I go and my husband and I will watch one of the five churches we are yoked with, mm -hmm. which is a, um, a church out of New York and um, it's fifth Avenue Pres Presbyterian church. Mm -hmm. He really likes the lead pastor, all the pastors there. So <clears throat> 
usually in between games on a Sunday, any given Sunday, I'll say like, so when, when I, can I put it on? He goes, just the sermon, right? I go, yeah, we don't have to sit through the whole service. Just not the, the worship, not the, no. like, I don't want to listen to all of that. No, 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 just no, Just get no. to the teaching. Yes. <laughs> so, and then, and I mean, this is like miracle of God. You know, they're doing it for me to watch. And sometimes mm-hmm. Charlie would watch with us, sometimes not. And one day Charlie starts talking. He's not really paying attention. And my husband shushed him to hear yeah. the sermon. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. I said, see, you're always more at peace and you learn something. I'm like, you love hearing these yeah. sermons. So um, it was it was a gradual change for me. It wasn't, you know, um, I'm still maturing in Christ. Mm-hmm. But even when I started to go every Sunday, it was like, check, I went Sunday. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of my life, the rest of the, the week mm-hmm. would look the same. But I have to say what it changed in my family and at home was I suddenly learned more patience mm. because COVID and homeschooling was very trying on everybody. Yes, it was. I mean, and I, and I already knew was starting to get to know Jesus then. And my son and I would pray at the breakfast table and say, he would say like, please let me and mom not get in a fight today. <laughs> we would pray on that in the morning at yeah. breakfast. And um, as I deepened my walk, with God, I started to become more patient, whether it was me alone saying like, help me Jesus. And like me not being irrational to me opening a a family discussion in prayer first. Let's say we got bad, you know, uh, um, report card from Mm -hmm. school. And my husband and I would say, we need to sit down, Charlie. I'd say, let's open this meeting in prayer first. Mm. And if they would want to say words, they would um, often not more often than not. It's me. But for them to hear my intention and say, like, please, God, God, my words, help me express what is on my heart um, in a in a clear manner. Um, and just please bless this meeting and um, please give me the words to say and give them your ears to listen. Mm. And already it kind of puts everyone at ease. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm not really in trouble. You know, mm-hmm. everything's open for a discussion. Yeah. And the intention is is good. So um, that set the tone. And you, has your faith changed the way you relate to people on a professional level as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, even like the way I, I host Big Brother, because even though I could never show it on television as I'm interviewing the evicted house guest, I always sat there in judgment of them as well, their behavior. Now it's like, I feel like they're all my children. I always felt like they were all my children, but then you have your favorites, right? Now I look at them through the lens of Jesus, or I try to, and I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and the chance to pivot um, and to express, you know, why they did what they did, why they said what they said, and not to be, not even to be like the hard hitting journalist, you know, like really kind of get them with Mm -hmm. that gotcha question, which I had done in the past with certain house guests and, you know, much to the delight of people like that person was the worst, but you had them answer, you know, now it's like, I want to hear the answers, but I'm coming with to them with a heart of love. Yeah. That's beautiful. I know that, um, you know, your faith came about because of a drastic and pivotal moment in your life that was really changed your your life and circumstances in it. That was difficult. And I would say a dark. And that darkness was a blessing in disguise. Yeah, right. I don't know if I would have found my way. And what do you think? Why is it so hard for people to rely on God when I I find that when you do have those moments in life, when we do need to find hope, that's the first place we usually turn to if we don't have a a relationship with God. I think it's because people are impatient. They have a hard time believing what they can't see. They want to control the situation and they want the outcome that they want and they're not willing to budge. So they feel like, I can only get the outcome I want if I'm in control. And it's like, let me tell you something. None of us are in control of anything. That's why we say, let go, let God. 
trust me, his plan is going to be much better. And he's, you're going to end up getting there. You could do it the hard way, kicking and screaming, or you could do it the way with faith and hope. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, people also have a hard time believing in like, I'm a good person. Why did this happen? How can a good loving God allow bad things to happen to good people? That's not for me to know, but you have to know that God will use all things mm -hmm. for good. Yeah. He can take anything and make it good. And he is sovereign. He either allowed it or he ordained it. Yes. So. One of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of Job. Yes. Which sounds I just crazy reading it. because uh, you, you feel for Job. I mean, God just allowed a lot of really horrible things to happen in his life. And yet it is one of the most redeeming stories at the end of that book because he, he, he gives him a double portion at the end. I mean, it's yeah. incredibly redeeming and it's beautiful, but you're right. Like we don't, we don't, we're never going to know all the answers and why God allows what he does. And, but, but I know that here on earth, he uses all of us to be a tool, to be an ambassador, to be a vessel, to share Christ with others and to share his love and, and to, act as most Christ-like and even, you know, the best, the best of us Christians, we still have our bad days. So we're not, oh, not always representative of him in the way we want to, but we get a new day every day. His mercies are new every day, yeah. every morning. I love the, um, I don't know who said this quote, but it said, preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Mm -hmm. You know, we, it's right there in scripture. We were all made in his image yeah so we have it in us but he also gave us free will yeah so like often i will pray that i will say like god please let me be a reflection of you and please let me see you in everyone you know even if it's just a glimmer yeah and i have to say like when you're around people Behavior is contagious. Mm -hmm. So if you show kindness, you're usually not going to get spit in the face, you know, right. it's, it, it breeds kindness, Yep. you know, and it's, it's what's, it's not that difficult, mm -hmm. you know, um, but people feel like it's them against the world and it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. It definitely is a choice to be made. Well, we take a listener question at the end of every episode. So this one is from Mrs. Hicks. And she asked if you had any advice for a widowed mom with an adult daughter who stepped away from her faith a number of years ago. So I think this question is not just about faith, but it's about a relationship between a mother and a daughter that that have some differences. And how do you think we could encourage a Ms. Few, Hicks today? A few things come to mind. I've learned um, about the power of prayer in numbers, having other people pray for her daughter. Um, do more listening than talking. Um, ask God yourself as the widowed mom, like, Please grant me your strength and your wisdom and how to get to where I want to be with my daughter in a relationship and get her faith back because mm -hmm. she yes. stepped away um, and and keep the faith and know that God knew her daughter was going to stray right now. And God knows the ending. It's just pray to have God's patience and wisdom and strength. Um, in how to move forward with, with her, with her daughter. Um, don't give up hope. Uh, and look for, look for the signs of, of God in her. Look for the, the, there are miracles around us every day, everywhere. Um, and look for that. And maybe 
you know, ask her you, daughter. You, you talked about this in your book and you said this to Charlie, I believe you're like, we need to put on our Jesus glasses when it, when, when you are having a hard time with a person and you, you know, it's so easy to grab onto that and be negative about it. But you're like, let's put on our Jesus glasses and find the good in that person. Something, find the treasure. Yeah. Because that person you don't like, God loves mm -hmm. that person. Mm -hmm. So find the treasure and go with that. Yeah. Great yeah. advice. Yeah. <laughs> There's a treasure in everyone. Thank you so much for being on my podcast and sharing your faith journey. I know it's going to encourage so many people listening. And I highly recommend that uh, if you have not listened to Julie's book, uh, but, but first, first God, God. <laughs> go listen to it. It's, it's really wonderful and so insightful into your whole career and behind the scenes things that were really, really interesting. But I genuinely just loved hearing your journey and growth and faith. And we'll be praying for you just throughout all the days of your life. Thank and you, Candace. Thank you. Welcome, Sister in Christ. I know it's been a while, but I'm like... <laughs> Thank you, Sister Candace. You know, I forgot to ask at the beginning if we could, whether before rolling tape or not, to open in prayer. prayer. So can we close in prayer? Yes, let's do it. Okay. Do you want to both speak or just you? Either, either one. Um, how about I open you close? Okay, sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time um, with Candace and her whole team here. Thank you for the opportunity, every opportunity and every platform to be a witness for you. I pray that all the ears and hearts listening to this interview, that they draw closer to you, whether they already have a relationship with you or if they don't, for them to start one and for us to all Put you first, Lord, and to all truly love one another. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for Julie, who's open and willing and vulnerable to share her life's lessons and and her story and the the moment that you grabbed a hold of her heart. And I pray for all of the, the people listening and watching this, that they too would be listening and looking for God in their life. And sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's big, but God, you're always there. You're everywhere at all times. And we thank you for loving us so much, for being so gracious and merciful, but being a God that brings, brings us joy because you ultimately want joy for each and every one of us in knowing you. So thank you. And I pray over all the listeners and believers um, within this podcast. Um, thank you. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. Thank you so much. Oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> Remember this season, I have a reset guide for you with tips and quotes from all of our guests. It's completely free at Candace.com. You can go there. And also the link is in our show notes. And next week, we get to hear from some friends who believe in fighting for family. Living in healthy ways means having healthy relationships and families can be hard, but there is hope. Chris and Julie Bennett have some incredible stories to share. And until next time, be grateful all day, every day. This has been a Candace Cameron Bure podcast, a production of Candy Rock Entertainment. Some of the products and services mentioned are paid promotions. Any advice should be confirmed with a qualified professional. Opinions and ideas are for entertainment purposes only and belong to Candy Rock Entertainment. All rights reserved. <laughs>